If you're familiar with my channel, you'll know I'm a fan of the Raspberry Pi, using a member of the family on several of my projects. But in this video, I just want to look at how to provide power, particularly when you're on the move. Usually, we just plug in the Pi and switch it on, which is great for static projects, especially for those running continually, like my door cam, but less good for things like robots, where the restriction of a power cable is far from ideal. Where we've got a bit of space, a power bank is a good alternative, just attaching the micro USB, which will provide the same 5 volt input as our plug-in adapter, but not so great where space is really limited. And that's what I want to look at here. Two solutions based around a small rechargeable lithium polymer battery, each using a different one of the Raspberry Pi family. First we have a Raspberry Pi Zero, like the one I used in my door cam, and for that I'm going to demonstrate the use of an Adafruit power boost, like I did for my wagon cam, using much the same footage. Then I want to look at something for the Raspberry Pi Pico, which I've used in several projects. And for the next stage of my flashing level crossing lights, I'm going to get battery powered with this LiPo shim from Pi Moroni. First up for my Pi Zero is an Adafruit power boost, and I've got the 500C. As the name suggests, this will get our battery voltage up to the 5 volts required for the Raspberry Pi, providing between 500 and 1000 milliamps. And when we plug in our battery, it leaps into life, giving us a blue LED for power and a red one to show we need to charge our battery, which is easy to do, simply plugging in a power cable to the USB, giving us an orange charging light. You'll notice the blue LED is still lit, and this is a big plus over a power bank, as we can keep our project running even when recharging, the completion of which indicated by a green light when we can pull out our cable. The inputs are simple enough, but we've got a couple of options for the output. To power the Pi, both requiring some soldering. One is to use the USB socket supplied with the charger, and a short standard cable to the usual input on the Raspberry Pi. For that, we just need to solder these pins on the back. But that's still going to be quite bulky, so what I really want is a more compact solution. As well as the standard USB input, we can also power our Raspberry Pi direct from the GPIO pins, and our power boost has two terminals just for that. And instead of that cumbersome USB socket, it's to those I'm going to solder two short jumper cables, from which I've snipped off the plugs, leaving the sockets at the other end. First I'm going to tin the bare ends with a little bit of solder, then putting a similar blob onto each of the terminals will make attaching the wires super easy. You can see I've already had a trial run at this, just to make sure everything works before going on to film. And with my red wire soldered to the 5 volt output, my brown negative can be soldered to the ground. As I've got the 0WH, the other end simply plug onto the pins of the Raspberry Pi. Red on pin 2 for the 5 volt input, and brown on pin 6, which is one of the several ground pins. The Raspberry Pi website has a complete list of which pin does which. And when we plug in our battery, which does have a bit of residual charge, the blue LED on the power boost lights up to tell us everything's okay, and the green one on the zero flickers as it goes through the startup sequence. So that's really cool, we got power. But at the moment, we don't have much control over it, having to physically unplug the zero to shut it down, and take out the battery altogether to turn everything off. Fortunately, Adafruit have thought of that, providing an extra couple of terminals, allowing us to add a switch, and luckily I had a suitable one knocking around, which just needed adapting by snipping off the duplicate legs. The Adafruit website has really clear instructions on how to do this, very much recommending the use of just two pins, so I'm snipping off the one that would connect to VBAT, leaving just the one for EN and the ground. And having stuck it to the edge of the board with a bit of superglue, I can solder the two terminals, for both electrical connection and to hold it firmly in place. Of course, you might not want to directly mount your switch on the board itself, but by running wires to those two terminals, you could easily put it somewhere more convenient. Now, with the switch off, when we plug in the battery, nothing happens, and only when we switch it on do we start to draw current, illuminating our blue LED, which lights up even though we've got nothing attached. So with the switch off, let's plug in our Raspberry Pi again. And obviously, only when we switch it on will it start to boot up, the green light flashing. Remember, this is only a sign of disk activity, not a power light, so don't expect it to come on continuously straight away. And that's our rechargeable power supply complete, small enough to fit into a model railway carriage, for my Wi-Fi wagon cam, the full video for which you can find in the link above. At the moment, that recharges by plugging in the USB, but I want to look for an alternative using the track voltage. So if you want to see how I got on with that, don't forget to subscribe. Now I want to look at a solution for the Raspberry Pi Pico. And for this, I've got a Pi Moroni LiPo shim, which is specially designed for it, fitting over the pins at one end of the board, back to back with the Pico. And if we want, we can sandwich a circuit board in between, like I did for my plant water monitor. 
soldering the headers on the top side of the shim. But back to my demo. Like the power boost, we've got a standard socket for the battery, and that plugs in in exactly the same way. But instead of a charging socket of its own, we actually use the USB of the Pico. And even though my headers aren't soldered, we can see that it's charging by the red light. Now while I could demonstrate a standard installation using the headers, I want to try something different. Fitting the shim back to back against a headerless board. In this case, the brand new Pico 2. Just joining the pins I need. And to find out which ones they are, I'm heading to the Pi Hut website, which is where I bought the shim. And in the view more section of the description, there's a handy link to the schematic, showing us not all pins have a function, and only a few will need connecting, saving us quite a lot of soldering. To hold everything in place while that happens, I've got a small square of double-sided tape, not a padded sticky fixer in this case, as I want the surfaces to actually be touching, and with the contacts all lined up, I can get on with the soldering. First of all, I just want to double check with the pinout diagram which one's which. And a good place to start is on pin 40, in the top right hand corner, for VBUS. For each of my connections, I'm going to use a little bit of resistor wire, push through the hole and solder on each side of the sandwich. The resistor itself is completely incidental, so that can be snipped off as close to the edge of the board as possible. Then the same thing for the next pin, the one next door, pin 39. I'm not sure what the difference is between that and VBUS, but the schematic shows both of them connected, so I'm going to do the same. Again, soldering my little bit of resistor wire on either side of the board and snipping off the spare. The next pin that's clearly shown as being connected is pin 36, the 3.3 volt output. And once again, I'm robbing a little bit of wire from that resistor, although there's plenty left, so I should be able to do all of my pins and still have enough left to use my resistor on another project. Slightly hidden away on the bottom left of the schematic is the ground pin connection. And this can really be to any one of the ground pins on the Pico, the ones with the rectangular ends. And I've chosen pin 8, as it's in the corner of the shim, diagonally opposite to VBUS. So I'll have solidly soldered connections on both sides of my board sandwich, rather than relying solely on my double-sided tape to hold everything together. And I think that's it. I've got the two 5 volt inputs connected, the 3.3 volt output, and a ground. But looking again at the schematic, I see that pin 37 is mentioned, and it seems to have something to do with the power toggle switch, so I'm going to go ahead and connect that as well. And now I'm pretty sure that is everything, although I'll soon find out if not. And with resistor snipped off and put back in my box, I can plug in my battery to test the installation. And with the white power light, everything seems to be fine, and all good too for recharging. That red light will turn green when fully charged, and our power toggle switch is working too, so our caution on pin 37 has paid off. Now to get our rechargeable Pico operational. This one will be controlling my level crossing lights, and with a slightly larger battery, should last that little bit longer, enough for a good running session before needing to be recharged. So whatever your Raspberry Pi project, big or small, you now know how to give it some rechargeable battery power.